Jerry chat, I saw about 20 different things that I could have a fight with him about and disagree with him on, um, which is what we always did every time we got together. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, a little better. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, thank you. I have business to do. Um, you might think that you planned this event tonight. The reality is, and you might think that you have the last word, the reality is, Jerry has the last word, as always. I saw Jerry for the last time, probably between five or six weeks before he passed. Um, and as Carol will tell you, as Brian will tell you, as Tom will tell you, um, he literally was fixated on knowing that he had died, or was dying, and uh, what it would be like, and what we would say, and what we would do. Everybody here had something, if you haven't noticed yet, and if you haven't, you should have noticed, that you were put in charge of something. Jerry put me in charge of something also. <laughs> Brian, you are the best daughter that any mother could ever have, and I am proud of you. Tom, no matter how angry I get at change, thank you. <laughs> to his cancer surviving group, you helped me really cope. To GLF and the members of you who are here today, and I know there's several of you, you were the definition of my life. And when he also said, this is was very hard for him, and I love you. And to the members of the Sage Room here at the center, thank you for my last battle. So those are my notes from Jerry. Now I get to talk from my heart. <laughs> Jerry's given me many things in my life, and I've tried to think over the last few weeks how I met Jerry and why I felt so close to Jerry. I, can't, I lived in Philadelphia until I was 18 years old, and on May 10th, 1969, I moved to New York. I moved to New York thinking that there were no gay people in Philadelphia. <laughs> I moved to New York because I wanted to be where I thought there might be gay people. Uh, and like many people my age, I had no prospects. I just left Philadelphia. I had no job, no school, no nothing. I was gonna move to New York, try to find a job somewhere, and I didn't know how I was gonna live. I just knew that I was different than everybody else, and I wanted to be with the people that I was like, and I know they were in New York. In 1969, we were nowhere on TV. In 1969, we were not on the news. We were, there were no gay characters on TV. We weren't really in the movies. You saw stereotypical figures, but they were never called homosexuals or gay or whatever. Um, we were not in the magazines, we were not on radio, there was no cable TV news, there were no cell phones, there was no internet. We were nowhere. So I came to New York like many other gay youths. I soon found out that gay people were in the village. So I went looking. I found Christie Street. And people of my age, what we did when we had no prospects and no nothing, we walked up and down Christie Street all night, every single night. One night, I was lucky enough to be walking up, and that's how you met your friends. And you hung out and you sat on the steps until they yelled at you to get off the steps. Um, I met a guy walking with another guy with a dog. The dog's name was Magoo. The man with the, with the dog was a guy named Bob Kohler. The other chunky guy, who was chunky at that time, uh, was Jerry Hoos. It was sometime in May, I have no idea. 
So now I'm going to tell a story that I very rarely ever tell, but since it's been up on this screen all night long and everybody's been talking about it. Oh, David, I got a particular space. Thank you uh, for what you said about GLS and GAA. Thank you. Um, um, my story with Stonewall is, um, and I love the fact that we had in this film with Jerry disagreeing um, with one person saying uh, it was horrible, it was great. Well, as an 18 year old who went to Stonewall, I gotta tell you, it was great. It was the first gay bar I ever went into. I didn't care if it was dirty, I didn't care, whatever. It was, it was correct. It played good music and we had fun, whatever. Um, my quick story about Stonewall is, is that the lights blinked, um, police came in, uh, I was carded. Never hear that, you never heard that story. Well, a few of us were carded and let out. And the reason I was let out, remember this, I still looked like someone from Philadelphia. What that meant was, I looked like the boy next door and there was nothing the police could do with me. I was of no use to them. The old guys, they take their money or blackmail, the queens, they could harass. So they, they didn't care about me. I was scared shitless. I had never been in anything like that before. I walked out and stood outside across the street at Sheridan Park and just watched. Watched for a long while. Um, I don't remember if I met Jerry that night or not. I really don't. But what I do remember is that somewhere in an instant, watching the craziness going on around me, in an instant, I realized it's okay to be gay, it's okay to yell it. I moved here because that's what I wanted to do. That's what Stonewall personally means to me. And the reason I mention that is, is because Jerry and I often talked about how we always knew there was nothing wrong with us. Even though at a time when we were growing up, morally you were considered a pervert if you were gay. Uh, the religious people thought you were immoral. The legal, legal and uh, police authorities thought you should be in prison. The psychiatric people thought you needed treatment. People were getting lobotomies. People were being institutionalized. People were being put in prisons. And yet we somehow knew that there was nothing wrong with us. We knew it was society was wrong, not us. And somehow, keeping a sense of humor about life during all of that was somehow amazing. We would go to GLF meetings, Perry, a scream and shout with each other, and then go out and walk down the street laughing hysterically. Um, it was part of our life. Um, Stonewall over the last few years has become a myth or a giant story and a lot of us, particularly me, um, has trouble dealing with it. Uh, and Jerry and I have talked about it through the years and we didn't realize the extent of the history of it until Obama mentioned those words. About a second after he did, I Skyped Jerry. And the two of us just looked at each other and cried. And the reason we cried, and I think my early movement people in this room will understand this tremendously, um, we were history, America was realizing it, and all the pain we had suffered and fought for for all those years, and even though we were laughing and having fun, there was a lot of pain. Finally, someone was recognizing the work we had done. That was important to Jerry's family. Thank you for giving someone who was a spirit and a joy to work with in those early days. We needed to laugh and Jerry gave it to us. He made us smile. Um, he made us happy when times were really tough. And you know what, it wasn't tough going off, going off to jail with Jerry. It really wasn't. <laughs> you know. Um, I guess I'll close with one last story, and David, someday you're the historian, I hope you look it up. I got arrested one time, and I believe the police station was on 10th Street, and uh, yes, and, and I have no idea what I was arrested for. No idea, it was a demonstration, I don't remember which one it was. Um, and they took me and they handcuffed me to the heating pipe. Um, and it seemed like after I was arrested, everybody else just went away. Well, I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't have anybody. Um, Jerry was the one who came in and started yelling, please, what are you going to do with him? 
<laughs> you just gonna leave him there? <laughs> he doesn't have any money. You really don't want him. Just let him go. And you know what? They did. <laughs> Thank you.